Hannah Moscovich joins me now in Studio Q. Welcome, Hannah. Thank you for having me. Well, let's, I mean, we should get you to uh, describe this story a little bit from your point of view. I sort of tried to paint a bit of a picture, but you give me the synopsis of Bunny as you see it. It tracks one woman's sexual history. So you meet her when she's in high school, and she's a hot dork, so she kisses all the boys and wins all the science awards. <laughs> right. And it travels with her through college into a sort of darker sexual awakening with a, a professor that she meets there. And then we jump 20 years into the future, and we see how it all turns out when she marries a good man. And mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. It's funny, that character of the intellectual, socially awkward woman with a love of sex is not a character that we see a lot of in art. I know. It's too bad. <laughs> it was fun to write. You wanted to, to redress that. <laughs> yeah. I w wanted to write a character that represented women I know of my generation and who were struggling with some of the things that, you know, I saw my friends and that I struggled with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, yeah, I wanted to represent a woman who likes sex and who feels like that's transgressive, you know, and who is trying to um, uh, work out how to be sexual in a society where that's not mm -hmm. totally accepted. Well, and the, and the nickname, I should say, the name of the play, Bunny, is based on the nickname that one of her friends calls her. And that's, I mean, I, was, it, was it intentionally um, sort of nuanced? Because some people might think of a sex bunny, but it's in, it's, we are told in the play that it's more in reference to her sort of skittishness. So it's meant to mean both. Right. And it's meant to mean, you know, being scared and being sexual and being scared of being sexual it's supposed to carry that. So tell me, you say that this is something that you felt was underrepresented, but also um, was really true for you and a lot of your friends. Tell me more about that and why you were interested in exploring um, these ideas that women of a certain generation have about sex and how they feel about those ideas. Yeah, well, it's why I draw on Victorian tropes within <laughs> within the play, because I think, you know, Within, a, within most of literature, the thing that women do is they choose between two men and they repress their sexuality in order to make good choices. So morality and sexuality for women end up being super linked. And I was, you know, interested in looking at that really specifically through the lens of a contemporary character who is struggling with her sexuality being transgressive, even though the only thing is she likes sex. Mm. And I think that's still, you know, you end up having to justify your sexuality through either being drunk, I was so drunk, I did it, or through love, I love him so much that I did it. Um, there's not much space in which to just like sex. Mm -hmm. You, um, Your plays are known often for, for taking on history and politics. And, and you've called this play your first foray into the autobiographical. Why did you want to go there or decide to go there now? I'm older <laughs> and I'm less blushy than I used to be. And I felt like I had it in me now to get a little bit closer. But yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I write about... You know, soldiers in Afghanistan or the children of Nazis in Paraguay. Um, it's very unlike me to write a character that's this identifiable. And one of the nice things about that actually has been that so many women come up to me and say, this is just like my life. Sometimes women in their 60s and 70s, because it's Stratford, are coming up to me and saying, my life was just like this, only mine was dirtier. <laughs> so there's a lot of beautiful, dirty ladies out there. Well, and I saw a lot of them. I was at the play last night in Stratford, and I, I looked around, and I thought, how's everybody going to like this? And because Knowing a little bit of what I thought it was going to be about. And wow, people were standing up and applauding. So yeah, you really have tapped into something. How does that feel? And I mean, and also how different does that feel for you? It sounds like it feels good um, compared to the kinds of things you've written about before. Well, it feels, for sure, it feels more, it feels more frightening to write something that's so much within my own perspective because you're 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 writing to some degree about yourself and I have written so anti autobiographically up until now um, and so then to go right into my own perspective and my own experience is extraordinary but then yeah there's like the payoff is so many women are coming up to me at parties and saying I was a hot dork or they were saying I I had a this like transgressive sexual experience that I want to tell you about. And like, 
yeah, there are women with canes who are saying to me, this is just like my life, you know, and white hair. So it's fun to represent, like, whatever women are out there who are, who like sex and who, you know, want to want to tell me that after the show. So you, you do feel a little exposed, but, but you yeah. say that's sort of the payoff. Yeah. Is knowing that you're... The, by the worth it part is the women coming up to me and like whispering to me, you know, the way women sometimes do about sex, just whispering that this mm. is just like their life. So why, let's talk about the shame that's attached. I mean, presumably that whispering is, is somehow attached to a little bit of shame because Sorrel, who is the character whose nickname is Bunny, but she is the main character in this play. And she is someone who enjoys sex, but it isn't really straightforward for her. She's very... Um, confused, I guess, and, and of mixed feelings, I think, about about sex. There's some shame attached. So t- why? I think because female sexuality is still just so transgressive, bizarrely. You know, like, it just is transgressive on some level to just want to have <laughs> sex. You've so, said that you've said that uh, young straight women almost need a pride parade to help shake off that stigma and really celebrate. Yeah, I mean there are communities and the director of this show and the dramaturg were from the gay community and so yeah, we talked a lot about sexual shame and sexual pride and the fact that heterosexual women <laughs> probably experience some of that shame that we, you know, and yet there's sort of like, so I guess, yeah, I wanted to write Bunny because, and to speak to that, to speak to the possibility of pride. Why is that shame so hard to shake off? I mean, I think it's just so entrenched, right? And um, and that's why I draw on Victorian tropes within it, because it's in all of our literature. It pervades all of our literature that, you know, the thing women mainly do in Victorian literature is try and repress their sexuality or choose the right man. And if they choose the right man, they get married. And if they choose the wrong man, then they have an illegitimate child and fall out of all good society. And and that's the only choice for women is either you do something sexually good and you win or you do something sexually bad and you lose. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's that's our canon of literature. So I think that's also why I wanted to write Bunny is to invert that. To give. Well, and she is, as you say, you work those tropes in. She is um, a student of and eventually a professor of Victorian literature. <laughs> so, are, I mean, do you think, you know, you think about uh, those ideals of, of romance and marriage and everything you describe, you think that we still are really contending with a version of um, those sort of rigid 19th century views on women's desire? Yeah, we for sure got so blushy in the rehearsal hall, you know, and for women, it you know, it just was so extraordinary to have the male character somewhat sidelined to the, a female story of desire, and then for women to be the ones doing all of the having sex in a play and doing all of the choosing of men in the play is just, it was, it's so different than what you normally would see on stage and what you normally, you know, would see at the Stratford Festival. Um, and and yeah, like, so this is a play in which, you know, we're trying to talk about that, about the female gaze, and it's the men who take their clothes off in the play, and the women who make the sexual choices. Let's talk about, you said that it was a bit blushy for people as they were rehearsing this. There were some, <laughs> you did, you had some re- rehearsals to that were designed to get the actors comfortable with all the um, the sex scenes. Can you share any highlights? Yeah, so Sarah Stanley, the director asked Stratford to hire to to hire a canoe and they went out on the the Stratford River and they uh, worked on one of the sex scenes in a canoe out on the river in public in out. public <laughs> sort of like ambient theater with swans with tourists going by eating ice cream and then later she asked that the Stratford Festival um, rent a CD hotel room because there are a couple of scenes that take place in a CD hotel room and so Um, They rented a by-the-hour hotel room, and they went and they did all of the scenes in the CD hotel room. So good for Stratford for being willing to rent us a CD hotel room in which to practice our our sex scenes. No kidding. Well, they're convincing. I will say that. The (laughs) scenes appear. (laughs) Now that I understand what went into creating them, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. And I know I'm loving. I'm just still for a moment stuck 
on the sex scene being rehearsed in the canoe floating down the river in the middle of town with the tourists and their ice cream cones. That's yeah. What, what did the people actors eating have their to say about that? And the ducks and the swans. <laughs> what did the actors say about that experience? <laughs> well, they they. Uh, you know, they said it was really useful to do it so that they knew what it was like to be in an actual canoe and what it felt like to nearly tip when you uh, try and have sex with someone. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact, we learned because of the sex that happened in the CD hotel room, we did learn that, um, you know, that in the theater we would have to reinforce the wall. So there's like a wall now in the Stratford studio theater that had to be reinforced so because that you it could happens have sex up against, against it. a wall mm-hmm. yeah okay all this behind the scenes intel <laughs> um as you say i mean the play is being presented be, the fact that it's being presented at stratford is not insignificant because that is a, a festival um known you know more for shakespeare than explicit <laughs> sex scenes up against the wall um You've said that you've had positive reaction from people at parties and so on, and I mentioned the the standing ovation. But what what are you hearing directly from and overall throughout the run from people in the audiences? I mean, how is this going over at at Stratford? Well, you know, I've been really worried about it. Oddly enough, I mean, in preview week when playwrights tend to panic, I was emailing David Oster, the producer, and saying, you know, do you think we should have a larger advisory sign with, you know, partial nudity, sex scenes, adult content, like a big sign in the entrance so that if I'm going to offend people, at least they know they're going to be offended. And he very sweetly wrote me back and said, you know, um, we could do that, but nobody is saying anything to us. Like nobody is responding with offense to us. So we don't think we really need Need that. So I, you know, and I, and Stratford has been so positive about having this play, um, which is, you know, different from the rest of the shows that are on at the festival in their, you know, in their roster for the year. They've been super positive about having a show that is edgier and dirtier. Um, And the audience is, I mean, I think I always imagine I'm going to horribly offend people with my plays and it's just drama because, people actually stand up and enjoy it and follow, so... I will say that one of our producers saw the show and there were a pair of women behind her who were very, apparently quite vocal about their disdain for the subject matter. They got <laughs> quite noisy after the scene up against the wall. Uh, does that bother you, that, hearing that kind of reaction? I think in the end I'd always rather be uh, have my plays be um, um, offensive rather than boring in the end. Um, And I do know that if you're going to push taste, you are going to offend some people. Uh, So I accept that. Is part part of of the goal to shock? You know, I I, I think I worried about that to some, like I asked myself that really genuinely, like, are are we trying to be shocking? Is that what we're trying to do? Um, But no, I think we were really authentically just trying to tell the story of sexuality. And if you're going to tell a story about sexuality, you have to have some sex in it. And at first I was really blushy about that and I didn't write it in until the dramaturg, Bob White, sort of pushed me and said, listen, if you're going to write a play that's sex positive, there has to be some scenes in which people are positively having sex. Like, Well, and is, I wonder in, if we are going to shake off that Victorian um, sensibility that, that we're still wrestling with in terms of our shame around all this, um, do we have to shock to sort of move the needle forward? Yeah, and maybe, I mean, maybe there is a positive version of shocking that isn't just, you know, for spectacle's sake. Do you know what I mean? Like, it isn't just, like, nudity for nudity's sake. And we did have nudity in the play partly because we wanted to talk about the female gaze. Um, And I think, yeah, if you are going to move it forward, then there is a portion of the audience that's going to be shocked offended, um, inevitably, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I don't think that the intention on our part was just to shock people randomly for the sake of shocking. There's a lot of humor in the central character's um, story, a Sorrel story, and a lot of it comes from her, her sort of Marxist upbringing. Um, I have to ask, was that, was that drawn for your, from your own life as well? But just, oh, I kept thinking, I've got to ask if her parents were, you know, these, these professors who, who uh, had, you know, pretty strict ways of, of, uh, of thinking in, your, in her upbringing. Was that drawn from your own life? Yeah, I mean, it's a parody and nothing in the play is 
you know, precise to my experience. Um, but yeah, for sure, I grew up in a, a hard left-wing enclave in Ottawa, and my father was a professor um, of economics and uh, social work. So there, there was like a sort of group of, you know, fairly radicalized left-wing people around me growing up. I did learn a lot of folk songs. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, that's all to some degree true, but none of the particulars in the play are true. They're just too far. Like the what what happens and you know the, the particulars that get talked about in the play are so far out there right? it's so, I'm you so far into an Wes Anderson to make it funny. Yeah. yeah and have has your family seen it i mean sometimes that can be the hardest um you know people who write either fiction or uh, memoir about you know personal things especially to do with sex sometimes the 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 parents or the family members reading it or seeing it is the biggest uh, hurdle to overcome what's What's that been like? My father hasn't been yet. He's going to come. And my mother came already. And she loved it. She thinks it's, she said it's her favorite play of mine. So there you go. And I had prepared her so carefully for the content and for there being some similarities to my upbringing because she's so used to me writing plays that are about, you know, a little girl who's a psychopath that has nothing to do with me or right. my life. And so she, yeah, she loved it. She was bawling afterwards. Do you think that you will mine your own biography for for future work again? Will you go back to that well, or do you think you've revealed enough? <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of projects upcoming. Like I seem to be, this is my confessional phase, so I have a, a couple of upcoming projects in which I, I go for it. Yeah. Well, well done on, on uh, having gone for it this time, and uh, we'll see if you can't just move the needle a little bit on shaking off some of that shame. Thank you so much for the conversation today. Thank you so much for having me.